It strikes me how privileged it is to be a physician, to be with people at, at time of their need, and at momentous times in their life, like delivering their babies, or at times of grave illness, or accident, or, um, or when they're struggling with big problems like aging and dementia, or, or when people are dying. All of those have a different flavor about them, but they're all really rich experiences. They challenge you to bring to them your complete focus and to bring integrity there. Uh, they challenge you to bring every skill you have ever learned as a human and as, uh, as a physician, as a scientist, and the art of medicine too because it's not all it's not all science it's about how you are with people you got to be really motivated for the right reasons and one of the things that can help you do that is to find a mentor find somebody who's in health care who'll take you under their wing and let you spend some time in their office uh, or out in their clinic or you know or find an organization that takes volunteers. I, I do volunteer medicine in uh, the Dominican Republic on the Haitian border two or three times a year. And I take students. And I have people who are interested in medicine or, or pre-med or, or medical students or residents or who are interested in nursing and that too, you know, it's not just medicine. And they'll come and spend a week with me over there. And it's an eye-opening experience to see a place where the poverty is that great, where the need is that great, and where if it wasn't for us they'd get no health care. So you get to see what medicine is like when you have to use your brain and your hands and your heart and you don't have a CAT scan to rely on or you know a big x-ray machine. Or you have to really be a physician. The hardest part is uh, the limitations that you have. Um, there's things that I know that we could do for people if they were here, where we have resources that we can't do there. And probably the hardest single thing for me was there was a, a young girl who I met. First time I met her, she had walked three hours through the night, through the mountains by herself at about age 10 waited in line about eight hours to see me in that clinic. I hadn't eaten all day, you know. I shared my sandwich with her. Anyway, she, she started coming regularly, you know, on each trip. I'd see her there, and she, she learned how to read because we run a school there, and she would help me in the women's clinic when I was taking care of the women. She would read to the kids. Well, one year between trips, because we only go three times a year, between January and June, she got strep throat. Now, here that's no big deal, right? Here you go to the doctors, they give you $8 worth of amoxicillin and you're cured. Well, there are no doctors there in between and she got it and she wasn't cured and it went to her kidneys and it knocked out her kidneys. And when I went back in October, she was dead. And I know that if one of us was there, or she had eight dollars worth of amoxicillin, she would still be alive. And that's the hard thing about working in impoverished countries. You see just how on the edge they are of survival. I, my, first, uh, my first school experience was terrible. I, I didn't go to kindergarten because they didn't have it in Japan. And when I went to Montgomery, Alabama, it was 1960. It was right in the middle of, uh, you know, 
George Wallace, I don't know if you know who he is, was the governor of, of Alabama, but it was during segregation. You know, there were separate drinking fountains for blacks and for whites and separate schools and all of that. And uh, a lot of racism. And I was this little brown kid with curly hair. And I went, I'd been in the summer in Texas all summer, so I was really dark. <laughs> and I went to, to the first day of school in uh, Montgomery, Alabama, and I, I went and sat in my chair. And about 10 minutes after they did roll call, the teacher came and grabbed me by my collar, pulled me across the room, and threw me into the wall. And then she sent somebody down to the principal's office, and they came and they, they got me, and they literally dragged me across the playground, lifted me over the uh, chain link fence, and put me into the uh, playground school of the, the colored school. Because they thought I was mulatto. They thought I was, had to be half black, because I had this curly hair and I was brown. So that was my introduction to school. And of course, the color school didn't want me either, because you know, because I wasn't black. So what ended up happening was they called my parents, and they picked me up. And eventually, I went to school on the air base, even though we weren't living on the air base. And that, and so I didn't like first grade very much. I didn't like Alabama at all. I didn't like all that prejudice, and you know, I couldn't understand it because, in it. In the armed services, you know, my dad was in the Air Force, they already had integration. You know, so I had friends who were black and brown and, you know, just whatever. We never thought anything about it when I lived on the bases, you know, Japanese in Japan. And then I came here and it was like a different world. So I didn't, I didn't like the United States. I didn't like Alabama. I didn't like George Wallace. And I certainly didn't like that uh, segregation stuff. The other thing that happened during those years, I think from junior high to, to high school that was very formative for me, is I met some Koreans from South Korea who, you know, this is the Vietnam War was going on then. One of the things our government did that was strange was they hired foreign troops, you know, to fight on our behalf. So they hired all these Korean black belts in Taekwondo, they call them the Tiger Troops, to come over and learn how to be F4C Phantom fire fighter, uh, fire uh, fighter bomber pilots. Excuse me, because they were so, you know, bright and quick responses and all. So they all came over, and I happened to meet some of them because my dad worked at the air base, and they took me under their wing, and they taught me taekwondo, and it was really amazing because it was three hours in the morning and three hours in the evening, five to six days a week I would go very disciplined. They didn't charge anything. What they wanted you was to be a good student, to work really hard, to be a person of integrity, to have indomitable spirit, to have respect for other people. So that was all fit really good with that idea that I had about trying to be a person who was a good person, who was going to be there for other people. It wasn't about like just learning how to, you know, be a kick-ass karate dude, you know. It was, it was really learning this other thing and this discipline, which really throughout my life has served me in learning how to really concentrate and focus and apply myself. And later, in later years, I taught Taekwondo, same way when I was in college and things like that. I don't know the answer to that one. <laughs> I, I, I tend to look at it that all these things that have happened through my life, whether they were hard or easy or fun or sad, have helped um, educate me to be who I am and to have more things to bring to the people I interact with, whether it's you guys or whether it's my patients or family or friends. So, you know, it's scars are useful too. <laughs>